let's talk about the production of steel by hot rolling. So this is chapter seven in the textbook in the description. Before we talk about the hot rolling process and what we do with steel after it's made, we have to talk about where steel comes from. Up until, I don't know, 80 years ago, all the steel you could find anywhere came from a blast furnace. Blast furnace is what takes the iron ore and makes it into usable metal. Today, most steel that you would think of as being new, some, so you go buy something from uh, some angle iron from Home Depot, right? You think it's new. You go buy a car, it looks brand new. That steel has actually been recycled. It was melted down in what they call a mini mill or an electric arc furnace with a bunch of other steel parts. It was checked to make sure the consistency was correct, the ingredients were right. They add substances if it needs it, and then they go ahead and let it cool down and roll it out and use it for whatever. There just isn't the demand for brand new steel from the blast furnace because it costs so much more to do. If the steel already exists and all you have to do is melt it, make it into a new shape, it's gonna be a lot cheaper than paying for the miners to get the iron ore, the miners to get the coke, the miners to get the limestone, to pay all the people at the blast furnace that keep it running. Uh, again, 24 seven, 365 days a year, all that extra effort gets totally bypassed when we can recycle the steel. Now, why do blast furnaces even exist, right? Sometimes you do need brand new steel. Sometimes you need it in such large quantities. So if you're building a bridge, right, you might need special steel from what they call an integrated mill. An integrated mill just means you got a blast furnace, you've got the steel furnaces, and you have all the heavy equipment to roll out shapes like railroad tracks or I-beams, all of that all in one place. So let's chat about what iron is, where it comes from, and what we need to put it in the blast furnace. So there's three kinds of iron in the ground. Magnetite and hematite are known as natural iron. They have over 60% iron concentration. So it means 60% of it is iron, 40% of it is rocks and dirt and stuff. Other kind, taconite, contains less than 60%, typically around 15 to 30% iron. Now this matters because the blast furnace needs to be about 60% iron to work. So if you have iron ore has less than 60% iron in it, it needs to go through what they call benefaction. Benefaction just means you get rid of some of those rocks and some of that dirt and make it more iron per uh, unit volume. So most of the iron in the United States lives in the north central United States and Minnesota in what's called the Masabi Range. It's been used for a very long time. You used to be able to go there and kick over a rock and find natural iron. Now this was great because you just scoop it up, and put it in a blast furnace, and you're good to go. Now, not surprisingly, that's all gone, right? We've used it all up. It's not a huge deal because there's still iron everywhere. Right? Literally the earth there is made out of iron, but it's the taconite variety that has less iron uh, for the amount of rocks. So about 15 to 30% iron. This has to be, go through benefaction. They essentially use a combination of crushers and magnets to get the iron away from the dirt and the rocks. And then they use a, a clay binder roll it up into little golf ball size chunks that are easy to store. So the golf ball size chunks of uh, benefacted iron can roll down a slide or go on a, a conveyor belt. Uh, they can be put in the holds of ships. Pretty easy to deal with. The clay just melts off when they need it to. So this taconite is where most of the iron that goes into a blast furnace today comes from. Let's talk about the smelting process. Smelting is taking what's essentially rocks with iron in it, turning it into liquid iron, and then at some point 
either ingots or taking that liquid iron straight to the steel furnace. So the blast furnace is a huge, huge device. It's a the size, you know, 20, 30 stories tall. It's made out of refractory brick. They run at about 4,200 degrees Fahrenheit. They're hottest in the bottom. At the top, it looks like an upside down vase. At the top, you have little mine carts that drop three different things in it. Limestone, coke, and iron ore. They all serve a purpose. The iron ore, kind of obvious, it's gonna get melted down and become the iron we're looking for. The coke provides the fuel. Now coke is just charcoal that's almost 100% carbon. It's basically specially prepared charcoal briquettes that are specially prepared to be 100% carbon. They get thrown in there with the iron ore, and then the limestone is there to mix with the impurities, so all that extra dirt in with the taconite, and float to the top. So they have really, really, really hot air that blows through the blast furnace, keeps the chemical reaction going, and the iron reduction process can occur. At the bottom of the blast furnace is called the hearth, it's where the liquid iron lives. Now, blast furnaces run 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They're gonna build up this liquid iron and then they're gonna get tapped. They're gonna drain the liquid iron and then add more materials. It's gonna heat back up and they'll tap it again. So they're not really made to store the liquid iron for any long period of time. The tapping process is quite interesting. You know, the bottom of the blast furnace might be a couple feet of clay or refractory bricks. And then there's just a plug that is some kind of clay. They have a big, big drill. It looks like a auger you drill, use for hole posts. They drill a hole in the side of that thing and let the liquid iron flow down a little uh, river trench that's made for that purpose. After all the iron is left, they plug it up with uh, refractory clay. They have you know, whatever robots to do it with. Now, obviously nobody's getting anywhere near that thing, but uh, they let the iron flow down a river. It either goes to what they call submarine railroad cars. It's just a big tank made out of refractory bricks. Keeps everything liquid and molten. That can go either to the steel furnace to be made into steel, or it could go and get poured to make pig iron ingots. So pig iron is a very impure form of iron. It's three to 5% carbon, but it's got a range of impurities. It's really not useful for anything but boat anchor. And even it probably wouldn't be great as a boat anchor because it's not very strong. It's very brittle, fairly weak, really uncontrolled mechanical properties. At the integrated mill, so where the smelting, refining, casting, and rolling all takes place. After you have that liquid pig iron, it's typically gonna to go to a steel furnace. So the two that we're gonna talk about are the basic oxygen furnace and the open hearth. The basic oxygen furnace is variation of the Bessemer furnace from the early 1900s, late 1800s. It's gonna use pure oxygen to heat up that liquid pig iron and literally burn out all the carbon and all the impurities. And then the whatever needs to be added back in is just thrown in in 50 pound bags. They just throw it in there and it gets all mixed up. And then it can be poured out into useful shapes or into a continuous casting uh, operation, whatever it need, they need to do with it. It can form you know, dozens of tons of steel in about an hour, very, very quick. The open hearth furnace is a giant swimming pool looking thing. This is gonna take a lot longer, typically around eight, eight hours or so to produce what they call a heat. So basically one batch of steel. The advantage of the open hearth is that it takes that amount of time, you can take samples, send it to the lab, and make sure all the levels of whatever constituents, all the ingredients are correct before it's poured into shapes. This is good for you know special steels, stainless or tool steels, things that are very carefully controlled. 
but the basic oxygen furnace isn't quite